So now that we're done with the recalling things from last week, I've also turned on the recording. Welcome everyone at home. You haven't missed anything that you haven't heard yet. Any questions? No, then let's move on. So remember we had this, so in for the second part of the course, we had set out this agenda for ourselves um, to effectively move towards deeper levels of making sense of natural language. That's what we're doing. So the first problem was to assign probabilities to strings, and we solved that. How did we solve that? Which model assigns probabilities to strings? Um, I, we ju just did observe that we can also use an HMM to solve that problem, yes. But the more basic model we applied to that task was the... La so the that problem is language modeling. So language modeling really means assigning probabilities to strings. And first we gave us an n-gram language model to solve that. And just now we observed we can actually also use an HMM to do language modeling. But we introduced, we motivated the HMM to solve this more complex problem of assigning categories in context to a sequence of observations. And here these are the parts of speech, the word classes that actually tell us a lot already about how to interpret this sentence. And that can also be very important cues in speech synthesis because some words actually look, have the same orthography but they are pronounced differently um, depending on their part of speech. And we've solved that problem, so what remains for us to um, be solved is the arguably deepest part of um, this sequence of making sense of natural language data. And we'll now look into syntactic structure. We've already observed that a sentence like, I ate sushi with tuna. What was your variant of that example, Morhof? Right, so Oslo cops chase man with a stolen car. Um, both are ambiguous. So this is maybe less ambiguous than Morhof's example. So if I say, I ate sushi with chopsticks, some might say, isn't that a bit crunchy? But most would, of course, see that the chopsticks are an instrument to the eating. They modify the eating event. Whereas the tuna most likely is inside the sushi. But of course, I can tell you stories about that incredible experience of me being in the uh, tuna tank at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. I'll never forget that experience. And then they served sushi. So I was there in the tank with the tuna and eating sushi. It's possible. So, um, a string like this um, has more than one possible interpretation, and we will invoke syntactic structure to get at those different interpretations. So, the thing I'll do next is motivate for you and then formalize this notion of syntactic or grammatical structure. After all, I think we all have a strong intuition that as we communicate, as we use natural language to exchange information, um, that there is a, a, a system of shared grammatical knowledge of rules about how the language works that we all use. That's what we learn, among other things, when we learn a new language. And so now we're trying to formalize part of that system, the rules of the language. So, um, so far we've looked at sequential, log uh, sequential models. They are, so sequential means they're linear. They allow, th they're better than what we call pointwise classification. They actually do allow for sequential dependencies. They so do take into account that it matters at which position in a sequence something occurs. That was not the case for the vector space model. So some problems are not sequential in nature. And, but both the Markov chains and the hidden Markov models um, are limited in how much structure they can recognize to sequences, things following each other flat. Formal grammar 
gives us a vertical dimension in addition to the horizontal sequential dimension, hierarchical structure. And, and we motivated focusing a lot of our problems in this class on natural language by saying NLP, natural language processing, is a big part of AI. And currently many people actually say language understanding, that's what is missing for the AI breakthrough. So um, to quote understand natural language, I think we have this intuition that there's more than just words following one another. So um, formal grammar will introduce and motivate as a tool towards making sense of the structure, hoping to enable some level of understanding of natural language here. Um, so that's an important step towards understanding. I won't claim that having a parse tree, which is what we will build, um, really is a representation of what an utterance means, but it's a, it's a crucial step in that direction. And hence we shift focus from sequences, from linear structure to hierarchical structure, to grammatical structure. And we needed a little bit of terminology in doing so. So the um, first observation is that words form groups. And um, those groups in several ways behave like a single unit. They, um, they stick together, they lump together, and we'll call these groups constituents. So constituents are the building blocks of grammatical structure. How do we recognize constituents? Um, we have a number of tests that we can invoke and that give us evidence of constituent structure. Grammatical structure is not something we can observe. It's something we need to hypothesize. But that was true already of the parts of speech. These are artifacts where linguists form an opinion about a useful meaningful way of carving up that space and how to use those categories. And the same will be true in syntactic analysis, only there's more structural complexity. So um, to motivate a group of words as a constituent, we will look at the test of exchanging a constituent of one type for a different constituent of the same type in the same environment, of coordinating um, constituents of the same type end of moving a group of words around in the sentence as one unit. So here are examples of these. Um, um, Kim read a very interesting book about grammar. What is in brackets here, we will call a noun phrase. A very interesting book about grammar. Kim read it. It's effectively the same high-level sentence structure, only now the object, the argument of the reading is a much shorter substring. It's a pronoun, and a pronoun, as the name suggests, can stand in, can function as a noun phrase. So both of these we will call constituents of type NP. And I can swap in, I can exchange any NP um, in that position. Um, Kim read a book, gave it to Sandy, and left. That's coordination. X, comma, Y, comma, and Z. And that tells us that X, X, Y, and Z each should be constituents and they should be compatible in categories. So in these cases, uh, we call these verb phrases, read a book, gave it to Sandy, left. Um, I would like to think you have an intuition that read a book is of a different category than a very interesting book about grammar. One is about an activity the other is about an object. So noun phrases tend to be objects, verb phrases and sentences tend to be activities or states. And this coordination example suggests that there are three constituents here and that they all have the same type and we will suggest as the label for that constituent category of that type VP, verb phrase. Finally here I'm moving something around. Read the book I really meant to this week, didn't you? Um, or a very interesting book about grammar um, all of you have at home. So that's a mechanism in English where I can take the normal canonical form of a sentence, if you will, and highlight one of the 
elements and I highlight it by moving it to the front. That's called topicalization. I make it the topic of the utterance. It receives more focus that way, more weight. So read the book. I really meant to this week. That puts a lot of emphasis that puts the emphasis on read the book. Or a very interesting book about grammar. All of you have at home, that puts the emphasis on that thing that comes first. And the thing that comes first is one such group of words. A well-defined sequence of words that lump together and function as a unit. So in this case, read the book is a VP type constituent that I can move to the front of a sentence. Um, um, and in my other example, it's not on the slide, it would be an NP type. But I can't do this to arbitrary words. Uh, meant read the book I really to this week. That's not English. So the rule of topicalization in English requires that what I move around, that what I move into the first position is a constituent, hangs together as one unit. So these are the three observations, if you will, tests that we will invoke to recognize constituents. Constituents are the basic building blocks of syntax. Um, and they will be different for each language. The rules of forming constituents are language specific, obviously. Obvious to me. Um, but they're also theory dependent in the sense that um, there's more than one theory of syntax. There's also more than one theory of what the syntax of the region should be. Linguists work by disagreeing with each other. That's a primary methodological tool in linguistics. Um, many sciences. <laughs> it's, a, it's a productive tool. And hence, um, any specific theory of syntax essentially articulates its own inventory of how many different types of constituents should we distinguish um, and how do we recognize them. Sometimes these tests may not be sufficient to decide whether this is a constituent or not. And sometimes these tests may give conflicting evidence. So that's the theory building side of formal grammar or syntactic theory for natural languages. We will take that as granted. We're not doing linguistics in this class, but so keep that in mind. These are artifacts that skilled scholars of language structure give us. They're not observable units uh, on the surface. And for each constituent, we will um, assume, say, that there's one element inside that we will call the head. And often the constituent category, the type of constituent actually betrays, tells us the category of the head. So a noun phrase, a very interesting book about grammar, that object is, at its core, a book. And hence, we'll say that book is the head of that NP. And it can, by virtue of being a noun, an NP headed by book, or a constituent, sorry, um, a constituent headed by a noun is what we will call a noun phrase. Um, gives books to students. To me, it makes perfect sense. I hope to you, too. It will soon. Give it a, a week or two. And um, this will all seem very natural. And um, gives books to students um, is about a giving activity. And hence, it makes sense to say that give is the head here. Um, give tells us that um, I need another two things. Give actually needs two arguments. We're omitting the subject, the giver, currently. And that's what we will call a verb phrase because its head is a verb. So that's the notion of constituents and of heads. And they are closely interrelated. Any questions? I'm doing a crash course in basics of formal syntax here. But you can actually apply all of these notions to the syntax of programming languages or any formal language. So if we did the language of arithmetic,
this expression, 2 times 5 plus 2. Actually, we'll come back to that, I think. It's a little early, maybe, too. Um, well, actually, no, I think we can exercise this. So, um, 2 times 5 plus 2. What's the value? I think I heard 12. Um, so, we'll keep that in mind. So, if, if you will, that's the meaning of this expression. But what is its syntax? Can we break it into constituents? How many words are there? Are the most... Th so there are, mm, there are three numbers and two operators. So I maybe would have said there are five words, but they come in different... There are two different types of words. Some are of type number, so we could have two parts of speech number and operator. And then you were going to say that the plus and the multiplication are the most important. Yeah, they're the operators, makes sense, but can we can we identify constituents here? Suggestion in the back. 2 times 5 you think could be grouped? Why? Yeah, in German we say Punkt vor Strichrechnung. Do you say that in Norwegian? <laughs> Trick für... <laughs> so there are the rules of operator precedence that tell us that the multiplication binds more strongly than the addition. And that means that I need to calculate this first and then add 2. And I can very nicely formalize that. In fact, I, I can, in the language of arithmetic expressions, I can put parentheses around sub-expressions. And I could even say I require a variant of the language of arithmetic expressions that is fully parenthesized, like Lisp. That would be wonderful. And so the fully parenthesized version of this would be this. And that tells us that here we have one constituent that then is part of a larger constituent. Yes? I would be inclined to make the operators the heads, yes. But that would be building a theory. So in formal languages the notion of head is typically not nearly as important as it is in natural languages. But, yes, a compiler would look at this as an expression of type multiplication. So the constituent category would be multiply. It would be very closely tied to the specific operator, and hence it would make perfect sense to say that the operator is the head. All right, so that was constituents and heads in a formal language. Um, now something we don't often invoke in formal languages are what is called grammatical functions. These are relations between constituents. And we're all familiar with terms, notions of subject, object, and they describe essentially um, how one piece of a grammatical structure, one constituent, relates to another. And we will make these explicit, we will define them actually in terms of the syntactic structure. So they are derived notions. And we'll come back to them, subject and object. Um, but then there is this notion of subject-verb agreement that is underdeveloped in uh, Norwegian because you have so little inflectional morphology. I mean, we have so little inflectional morphology left in Norwegian. Um, we have more in German. <laughs> Um, so, subject-verb agreement means that, um, in English, um, the, de the decision surprises most of us. The decisions, plural, surprise most of us. That's subject-verb agreement. Uh, 
singular subject requires a singular form of the verb. A plural subject requires a plural form of the verb. It's the one you, the Norwegians among you, you tend to write wonderful English, but you need to watch out for your subject verb agreement. It's the one thing I think I correct most when I read drafts of master's thesis or anything. Um, and so here we've constructed an example where we say the decision of the Nobel Committee members surprises most of us. That's the way to say that in English. If I varied that and said the decision of the Nobel Committee members surprise most of us, ouch, that's not grammatical English. Because it does not obey subject verb agreement. I have a singular subject and hence I need the S form on the verb. Why could this be troubling for a purely linear model to capture subject verb agreement? So, it would maybe say, as many grammar checkers do, the grammar checkers try to give feedback on subject verb agreement. Um, it would maybe say, I look to the left, that's usually where the subject is of the verb in English, for something that is a noun, and then I determine its number, whether it's singular or plural. That would take me to members, members is plural, and that would predict I should have surprise here. But members is not the subject of surprise. Members is actually part of this whole noun phrase here on the first line. So, the decision of the Nobel Committee members, that is one constituent. That's the subject noun phrase. And the head of that noun phrase is decision. And so what determines subject verb agreement is the head of the actual subject noun phrase. And that notion I can only obtain by invoking constituent structure. That transcends, that goes well beyond purely sequential structure. So this is, I think, a strong argument for the introduction of this additional complexity. So, subject-verb agreement reflects grammatical structure, not surface order. All right, so finally, then we can maybe take the break actually a little early. Um, to sum up, in a sense, um, we motivate grammar syntactic structure, I'll say grammar and syntactic structure interchangeably almost. Um, grammar arguably is more than just syntax, but um, syntax is the largest part of grammar. So, we'll motivate, we'll put to use uh, formal grammars as a tool to aid understanding of natural language and to bring home the intuition and uh, realization of the importance of formal grammar. Here are some, some tasks that formal grammar allows us to solve. Um, for example, um, to judge or predict whether or not something is well formed, whether it's actually, whether it obeys the rules of the language. That's effectively grammar checking. Or a machine translation system, of course, doesn't just want to get all the right words, it also needs to arrange them according to the rules of the grammar of the target language, which can be different. Some languages, like Norwegian and German, like their verbs in the second position, relatively early on. Other languages, like Japanese, have them at the end of the sentence. So, that's something that a machine translation system needs to juggle. So, well formedness is key to us accepting natural language and actually making sense of it. So, uh, if I tell you Kim is a, a girl or a female student, um, Kim was happy because what goes into the gap? She passed the exam. Kim was happy because her final grade was an A. So, the same pronoun comes in two different forms and only one of them fits into different syntactic contexts. That's grammar. We need to know these rules. Um, so, semantically, it, it's just a pronoun. It's a reference to that girl. But I need to put it in the right form for these sentences to 
ring. Kim was happy because she final grade was an A. It's getting hard to understand. We can kind of reason over what a non-native speaker might have intended, but um, that is not an utterance that immediately um, conveys a clear message to us. Um, we've observed ambiguity already. One of my favorite examples. Ha have her report on my desk by Friday. What do you think that means? I've just given you a sentence of English, a command. What am I asking for? Any native speakers? No, but nevertheless. <laughs> okay. So, somehow compile, produce a report do reporting on the topic of my desk. Because there's actually something wrong with my desk. So it's important that the <laughs> that the sort of office security people come in and look at that and, and write a report. Yeah. Yeah, and that has to happen before Friday. <laughs> Is that the reading everyone's getting? No, what do you think I was asking for? Right, and so they are asking. So, uh, like in a <laughs> like in a German university where professors actually have assistants, are lazy bums. <laughs> so, a German professor might say, uh, "She's been working on that report. Uh, I need to see it this week. So, have her report on my desk by Friday." So in this case, report is an object. It's the thing she's written. Um, so there, there are obviously two readings here. Are there others, maybe? All right, so by, by tells us something about the time, but it could mean yeah, fr or Friday essentially is a is a is a time point that extends over 24 hours. I would always interpret that as by the end of Friday. That's how I interpret deadlines, and I think you do too. <laughs> Actually, we often specify the hour. <laughs> uh, more readings. So that was more of a semantic ambiguity, not not so obviously a structural one. So we observed already report can be the activity of reporting. That's what we would call a verb, or it can be an object. A written document, that's a noun. Use your imagination. There are 12 readings, at least. There we go. Now, now, with, now we're talking. Exactly. I'm the kind of person who <laughs> thinks reports are best given while people stand on desks. Very agile. I mean, we should all stand on desks, of course, so that we maintain... So, um, uh, make some female person do some reporting while she is on my desk. <laughs> um, um, see to it that the report appears by Friday and be on my desk while you see to it. So the other reading have. So ha we can paraphrase have in in several ways. So have can mean make someone do something, cause someone to report, or it can mean um, make something appear, or it can of course just mean possess. So I have an iPhone. That's a different have. So, there are 12 different interpretations, and they come in increasing silliness. But there's more than one without context that kind of is plausible. 
And this is the example we've observed before. That's one we'll discuss many more times. Um, with chopsticks or with tuna, depending on which of the two nouns I pick, I get a different plausibility rating, perception, of whether the eating is with chopsticks or the sushi is with tuna. So different preferences for the structure. All right, so structure, grammar, um, make explicit structural ambiguities. They also enable us to um, go from structure, from syntax, to meaning, to semantics. So I have three sentences here that we will typically call paraphrases, and that means they describe the same situation. I think you'll all agree that here there's Kim and Sandy and a book, and there's a transfer of the book from Kim to Sandy. That's the situation. But there are three different slightly or mildly different ways of describing that situation. And these should have different syntactic structures, but they should all, at the end of the day, give us the same meaning. They should arrive at a, a representation that is even more abstract than constituent structure, than what we will compute here. And um, that abstraction is enabled by recognizing the syntactic structure. So I think that's my motivation for formal grammar. And let's take a break here and then be back in 15 minutes and make this more precise. All right. Let's resume. You all must be terribly eager now to learn more about formal grammar. I'm sure you are. So let's do that. Um, uh, we'll introduce context-free grammars by example first. Let's assume none of us knows any Spanish. But I actually know something about the grammar of Spanish, so I can tell you that much. And then we'll use that to actually make sense of Spanish, just as a computer would. So. Um, here I've written down some, some rules where I have um, um, an, a notation that you've probably seen in Bacchus Nauer form in the description of, of programming languages. I essentially say I can call something of category S, I can build a constituent of type S, when I find something of type NP followed by something of type VP a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. So S is a sentence, a VP is read the book, a noun phrase is my wife um, and my son, so that I get agreement, because <laughs> I had given you a plural VP, read the book. I can put these together, the noun phrase, my wife and my son, read a book, plus the verb phrase. So that gives me a sentence. So the notation means um, something on the right-hand side of the rule, occurs in this configuration, this sequence. And when that is the case, I can group the whole thing into a new constituent and give it the type on the left-hand side of the rule. So this is a constituent forming rule, a grouping rule. And I have four of them. So a verb phrase I can build from a verb followed by a noun phrase. I can also build a verb phrase from another verb phrase followed by what I will call the prepositional phrase. And the prepositional phrase is not something we have seen so far, but it's defined here. It's something where a P, a preposition, is followed by a noun phrase. So these are the structural rules of Spanish. They are actually very similar to English. Um, and here are some rules where the right-hand side is a word. It's no longer a constituent category. So this is what we'll sometimes call the, the lexicon. And the word Nieve, or the words Nieve, Juan, and Oslo, all are of the type, the constituent category NP. The word Amo is of the category V, and the word N is of the category P. So that's all we know about Spanish. And um, Right, so these are the... These are the Recursive rules, where on the right-hand side I have other constituents, and these are the lexical rules, where on the right-hand side I have a single word. Um, here is a 
sentence of Spanish, Juan Amor Nieve en Oslo. Um, and here I've now drawn a tree. And how did I construct that tree? Um, it's entirely built following the rules of the grammar. So it's a tree that has at its top node the category S, and that has two daughters, which corresponds to the sequence NP, VP. So this subtree here, the top subtree of depth 1, S with the daughters NP, VP, instantiates this rule of the grammar. I can do this recursively. So this VP daughter here is an instance of another rule of the grammar. And same down here. And here I have a something that I call a PP, a constituent of type PP, whose daughters are a constituent of type P, followed by a constituent of type NP. You probably see what I'm doing here. Now I need to connect that to the actual words of Spanish, and to do that I invoke the second group of rules from the grammar. So Juan is of category NP, Amo is of category verb, Nieve is another NP, N is a P, a preposition, Oslo is an NP. So This tree uses almost all of the rules, and it is built in a manner where the leaves of the tree correspond to my sentence of Spanish, and all of the constituents, all of the nodes, the non-leaf nodes of the tree, obey some of these rules. They, they group things the way the rules allow me to group them. So you could say that this NP, th this NP, this node, is a constituent. It's a one-word constituent, so there's not much lumping together <laughs> yet. Um, but this is a, a constituent, and together with this constituent here, it forms a larger constituent, where I now lump together, I group the P constituent with the following NP constituent, and call both together, the new group, call that PP for prepositional phrase. All right. How did that help us? Well, um, I could now pair, um, I could tell you a little more about Spanish, namely I could tell you how to compute semantics, how to compute meaning. And we'll use a very simplified meaning representation language here that would make a real semanticist scream in horror, I'm sure. But um, um, he sits next door to me, but I think he accepts that simplification can be useful for teaching purposes at times. So, And let's just say that I say for each expression, each rule in the grammar, I have a meaning expression. I write them in curly braces here. Um, that's just to, to signify that there are, there are statements in semantics. And I'm assuming some kind of predicate language, uh, first order predicate calculus, maybe some kind of logic language. And I simplify and say the meaning of nieve is the symbol or the concept snow. So I conveniently use concept labels here from th that resemble words of English. But this is an abstract symbol. Um, the constant, the meaning associated with Juan and Oslo are John and Oslo, so these are atoms essentially. We get some idea of how we would interpret them. Um, the meaning of Amo is a lot more complex. That is a relation that I call the Adore relation that involves two arguments, A and B, and the lambda b, lambda a here is just some notation. It's a function, essentially. If you've taken functional programming, you recognize the lambdas. So this is a two-place function. It's a function that looks for two arguments, a and b, and will put them into the first and second slot argument position of this adore relation. 
And the same is true for n. That's a two-place function. It takes two arguments and puts them into a relation that I call in. Finally, up here, um, I want this notation to mean function application. So when I say um, the meaning associated with the rule pp goes to pnp is p of np, then that means that I take the semantics, the meaning associated with the first order, the p constituent, and invoke it as a function on the meaning associated with the second constituent, the np constituent. So, hence, the meaning associated with p's better be a function that accepts at least one argument. Okay, let's put that to use. So, here I have the same tree, the same structure, but now I actually put the meaning expressions on the nodes. So, rather than, in fact, I prefix them, I still have the constituent categories here, but I have also paired each node with the corresponding meaning expressions. Down here, these just come from the grammar for the words. Um, there's no, no, not much lumping yet. Um, hence, for each of these constituents in the bottom row, um, their meaning expressions are just what the grammar gives us. They're the building blocks. Now I start to put things together. So, for example, when I build the VP, from the verb amo and the np nieve, the meaning function or the procedure for combining the meaning of the two daughter constituents is to invoke the function associated with the v on the semantics associated with the np. So the v is here. That is a function. It has a lambda b, lambda a. It's looking for two arguments actually. I give it one. That one argument goes into the first argument slot, so that's the B here. So Snow enters this second position here in the adore relation. What remains is a function that's looking for one more argument. So I actually do partial stepwise function application here. I have a function that needs two arguments, I give it one. I'm left with a function that needs one more argument. And the one thing I've given it is in that slot where the original argument um, put it. And so um, that's the, the, the procedure for what is called meaning composition, building more and more complex expressions of logic from the pieces according to what the grammar tells me about the structure. So I can do the same over here. Um, the semantics associated for PP goes to PNP is function of the P applied to the NP. You can also look what happens when I build a VP. Um, VP goes to VP PP. The rule tells us the PP is the functor, so um, that function is applied to the semantics of the VP. So that's how this plays out here. So P is a two-place function. I give it one argument. That argument goes into the slot labeled D. What is left, I'm sorry, is a one-place argument, uh, a, a one-place one function that is now looking for the, the first argument here. I put these two together. Um, the PP is the functor, so uh, it's looking for one argument. That argument will be the semantics associated with the VP. So that whole expression here goes into the C slot. So I now have in, adore, a, snow, comma, Oslo. And to keep track of remaining missing arguments, all of these lambdas are pulled out to the top. So they are collected at the top. Strictly speaking, the adore a snow goes into the slot of the lambda c here in the in relation, and the lambda a that tells us how many remaining arguments and what they are is pulled to the top. And now s goes to npvp, the vp is the functor, so that its function is applied to the semantics of the np. The semantics of the np is just a constant, that goes into the place of the a here, and I'm left with an expression that looks like predicate calculus. And that says 
there's a, a relation and a door relation between John and Snow, and that whole thing is in Oslo. That's something we can interpret. So what does that sentence mean? <laughs> John is in Oslo and adores Snow. Yeah, so John adores Snow in Oslo, yes. But saying it that way, of course, um, So, somewhere else, yeah. Um, we might have snow in Oslo this weekend, but those of us longing for, th for the snow, like my daughter, uh, might look at pictures of snow somewhere else. So, there's another interpretation. So, this is our first tree. And here, the in Oslo, or the en Oslo, um, lumps together, forms a constituent with the uh, adore snow. So that effectively means that the adoring is in Oslo. The activity is in Oslo. We see that up here. The adoring is inside of the in relation. But we have uh, another rule where we can, so that's the same tree here, where we can take, a so back to just the syntax, where we can say um, a PP, no actually I don't have that rule, I'm now giving you another rule. I had forgotten to tell you about another rule of Spanish. I can also build an NP from an NP followed by a PP. And I invoke that rule here. Now I get snow in Oslo as one group, as a constituent. And that is the argument of the adoring, Amo. And so that would correspond to my buddy one actually lives in Barcelona, but he's a keen skier. He just can't get enough of snow. And so every time I post on Facebook a picture of snow in Oslo, he finds that really adorable. So this is snow in Oslo that is adored by Juan wherever he is. So the object is in Oslo now but we don't know where the adoring happens. And we see that in the semantics here, so the snow is now inside of the in relation, but the adore is not. And if we compare that here, the adoring is inside the in relation, but we know nothing about the location of the snow. So here, that could be us, in Oslo, adoring the snow that no doubt is somewhere in the Norwegian mountains already. 